there is an alternate gospel for today that reads Luke chapter 13 beginning at the 22nd verse. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Lord, will only a few be saved? Jesus replied, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able. We serve a God who sent the Son not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Probably the best known verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 17 goes on to say, For the Son of Man came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In other words, we serve not only a risen Savior, but we serve one who was sent for the specific purpose of saving humanity. Hell, we are told, was not meant or intended for human beings. It was for fallen angels. And therefore, God in his goodness sent his son to be for us, that savior, the one who points us to way to eternal life. So this song reminds us that a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. <clears throat> Next word. 
this tells us where we were all like to go one day. To be with our Lord, our Savior, our Maker, and our Redeemer. When clothed in His brightness transported, I want to meet Him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation is wonderful love I shine with the millions on high.
that you have to trust that I'm coming through for you. Because a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. It is exactly at this time that when we are dead in trespasses, when, we, when it looks as if we have no way to turn, God in his goodness still reaches out to us and says, Come, ye who are weary, come home. It is exactly at this time that we are reminded not of so much of who we are, but whose we are. If we then could love our children in such special ways, if we could be there for our children and provide their every need, what about a loving, merciful, and good God reaching out to us at every step of the way? That's the nature of the God whom we serve. And isn't it good to know that God isn't like human beings, but rather he reaches out to us in love at all times. And this is the good news of the gospel, you know. We hear too much damnation and condemnation, but that is the old life in sin. The hymn writer says, no condemnation, now I dread. Jesus is all. In him, it is mine, alive in him, my living head. In other words, you don't have to worry about condemnation. Not that we are perfect, you know, far from it. Because there's none who is perfect. We are all sinners redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But I want us to contrast for a few minutes or see the difference between the old life and the new life in Christ. Yes, at one point we were dead in our trespasses. As the hymn writer says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. In other words, things are completely different. We are alive in Christ. The hymn writer says, alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. People said that on that great waking up morning, Anglicans are going to rise first. You know that? Oh yeah, it says so. You could quote scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, The dead in Christ are first to rise. <laughs> but we serve a risen Savior, don't we? Christ the King, wake up this morning. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever human beings might say. He is alive. And therefore, we are a living people. And we not only are alive there, but we have a great hope of what is going to come in the future. So yes, we were dead in our trespasses. That's when we were in the clutches of Satan. But God in his goodness sent his son. He says, and he answers the question, will those who are saved be few? There are many who will be saved because he came not for the few, not for the righteous. Indeed, it was for the unrighteous that he came. In fact, if, if we were righteous, why would a Savior come at all? He came to save those who are on the periphery, those who did not know where they were going. And the Master showed them the way. So we shouldn't be surprised when we ourselves are there. In the old life, we were the object of wrath. We were the object of judgment, damnation, and condemnation. But God in his goodness says, 
there is another way. You don't condemn my people like that. So anytime you hear somebody just condemning other people, watch it. They're not speaking on behalf of God. God alone is judge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. In other words, we are a part of the resurrection experience. We are a part of the experience that would tell us that there is indeed life. And so in the new dispensation, we are shown God's mercy, God's grace, and his salvation, and his salvation. As the hymn writer says, "'Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out me, even me. It was the slave owner who penned the hymn of the words of that beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace. When he realized that he had killed so many people through the slave trade, he penned the words, you know, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's blind, but now I see. Yes, when we were in a life of sin, death, and damnation, away from God, we followed the ways of the world. But now we can stand for Christ and the truth. You know, when, when we truly follow in Christ, or when something new has happened in our life, we don't have to tell people that we're born again, you know. People will see. Some of us like, oh, I've been born again. Yeah, you may have been born again. But guess what? You ain't gonna tell me. Let me tell you that something new has come over you. That you indeed have changed. Let me tell you, in fact, people will tell you, or people will say, will say about you, I don't know what's happening to Mary, I don't know what happened to James, I don't know what's happening over there. But whatever they do doing, or whatever has happened to them, I want it to happen to me. That's the way the gospel goes. Yes. And so in that case, the writer said, I'm not ashamed to own my God. You know that song? I'm not ashamed to own my God or to defend his cause. Maintain the honor of his name, the glory at the cross, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was Christian 
not to condemn, but to encourage. As we see the old life that had us enemies of Christ, now isn't it good to know that we are a part of God's household, one of his many children. Nothing super special about us that is not special about other people, but we were hostile to God. St. Paul reminds us, but now, St. Peter says, we are a royal priesthood. We are God's own children. Once we didn't know mercy, but now we have received mercy. And God has brought us out of darkness into his own marvelous light. That is the gift of God's salvation. Once we were enslaved to sin, him writer says, I was sinking deep in sin, far, far from that shore. But Christ came and he made the difference in my life. And we are told that out of this bondage, the Son has come to set us free. And we are assured in Scripture, whom the Spirit, whom the Son frees, is what? Free indeed. Free at last. A few weeks ago we celebrated the Feast of the Emancipation. Unfortunately, too many of us just think of it as the August Monday holiday. Yes, it is that. But it's predicated on the fact that in 1833, the Declaration was signed in England, or the Act was signed in England for the emancipation of the slaves. And it came into effect one year later on. But 26 years before that, in 1807, slavery itself, the slave trade, was abolished. Slave masters were permitted to carry on slavery for the next 27 years. So in 1834, we celebrate Emancipation Day. And after that, four years later on, the people, the slaves, were free to go. <clears throat> That's what we celebrate. We celebrate physical slavery. In the Bahamas, we celebrate majority rule. And without talking too much, we know the impact of that. We know the significance of that. But you know, freedom ultimately is determined by what is in here. Not so much by what is out there. Because if our minds are not free, then we wouldn't be free at all. Indeed, you might have heard the story of this gorilla who was in captivity. For many years, he grew up in captivity, in a cage, probably 20 by 20. And they decided to let him go into the wild. Of course, every day while he was in captivity, he would just walk around his cage. They let him go in the wild. And they watched him. And for several days, all he did was walk around in the same circle, 20 by 20. He had become accustomed to that. That is the mentality of some of us. We don't know what true freedom is like. My brothers and sisters, let's not live as if we are people still enslaved to sin. When we allow the devil to overtake us, to continue not only to tempt us, because he'll always be there tempting us, but when he allows us, or when we allow him to overwhelm us, then we know that we continue in this enslavement. We have already been set free. There is no more freedom to come. There is no more salvation on the horizon. It is there for us. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Would you are evil a victory win? Yes, there is power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. That's what God has in store for us. A new life in him. 
So I'm urging you today not to follow our own thoughts, not to follow the evil thoughts of the past, but knowing that we are raised up to, to, to glory. We are raised up to a new life in Christ. This life is stored up for us. But we have to be there to cash the check. I can write you a check that has your name on it. Don't, don't get carried away. I ain't going to do it. <laughs> but if I write you a check that has your name on it, you could be a millionaire. Write a check, but not, not for me, but I'm just talking. You know, using it as an illustration. Some, let me move from that. If somebody write, if Donald Trump writes you a check <laughs> for a million dollars, you can say, wow, I'm a millionaire. But you know, you're not a millionaire until you go and present it. You're not a millionaire until you go and say, here I am. Or as they say in Jalpano, I come from my teens. <laughs> you see, you, you, you're in it until you cash it in. So yes, salvation could be there available. And we all know it is. But unless you say Check my name on the register. I've come to claim it. Then having claimed it, we work hard to live it. Because claiming it and living it are two completely different things. Yes, there are many who say, yeah, I do it fine. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb and I'm all wicked and Satan. But we are not here to condemn. We are here to encourage all and sundry. So my brothers and sisters, in answer to the question, will those who are saved be few? The truth is, we don't know. But what we are concerned about, or what should be our concern, as the hymn writer said, not my brother, not my sister, but as what? Me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So rather than malign other people, vilify them, talk bad about them, how terrible